Well, Adam Krauss from Knowledge Resources. Welcome to um, our book event. We publish within the context of South Africa, Africa and emerging markets. So tonight we, we celebrate with um, Jeffrey why collective bargaining is failing South Africa. Really hitting very hard at, um, at why collective bargaining has failed, but then only not, not only criticizing, but then also come up with um, profound solutions and recommendations. So for those of you who don't know uh, Jeffrey that well, um, he started his career off in the Eastern Cape, uh, working there among uh, trade unions and the, the new industrial relations uh, framework that was originating in the, uh, in the 1980s. Moved on to Stellenbosch Business School, there, and he wrote a book uh, there for the Institute of Futures Research on the South African trade union movement and its possible impact on future political scenarios. Moved on to WITS. He, he, today he boasts a PhD, an MBA from, as I said, uh, Stellenbosch, and then uh, LLM, which he did at WITS. And it's particularly the LL, LLM, if you look at the research and the dissertation that he came up with, South Africa's voluntary relinquishment of its nuclear arsenal and accession to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons in terms of international law. And he had to get special clearance to um, to get into these secret documents of that time, of what happened uh, on, the, on the background of, um, of the negotiations around um, um, destroying our nuclear bombs, basically. And that model that he developed served also in the negotiations in Iraq and Iran. So he, he made a, not only a, a contribution by writing it up, but in terms of uh, making a contribution worldwide in that respect. So those of you um, that know Jeffrey well, would know that this is a very uh, provocative and interesting book. And without further ado, I'm going to welcome Jeffrey with us and let's give him a warm welcome and he's going to say a few words on it. Thank you everyone for, for coming here. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I'd first of all like to just um, say thank you to a few people who were really important in, uh, in the development of this book. Um, it's dedicated to South African journalists who write the first draft of history. In, in South Africa, it's often an incredibly trying and demanding job, profession, and they act under very, very difficult circumstances. Often their lives are a threat. When they put in a contra view, they can become very unpopular. The question of why is collective bargaining failing in South Africa? I did a, an extensive literature review of all the media in South Africa of this first draft of history. We have serious talent in this country and these people are, these journalists are offering a new narrative on, on, on South Africa. And so that they are the people in the first instance that I'd like to acknowledge. And I've acknowledged all of those people in my dedication. I also would like to acknowledge Jenny Kroll, Anna Ferreira, Ines Ferreira, and Sia Joubert for the editorial process, which was very, very helpful. I have loved working with Wilhelm Krauss. He's an extremely efficient and effective person. And then I would also like to acknowledge my son, Adam, who did a, a sketch of me in the, um, no bias here at all. Um, how did the book come about? I teach negotiation and deal making at Fitz Business School and if I had to go along and look at a sort of a pervasive question that arises. During the 1980s, we did something remarkable in South Africa. We were involved in the negotiated transition and this revealed sublime levels of wisdom sometimes, of um, skill in negotiation, and of, of competence. And now, as we move 20 years past the transition, everything seems to be falling apart. Social dialogue seems to be falling apart. We have massive unrest um, indicators. Um, we have the fifth highest indicators of industrial um, unrest in the world at the moment. And uh, why is this going wrong? This is the question that is posed by all my students, all the executives that I work with. If I wanted to 
be re relevant and if I wanted to do something which was really useful, I needed to confront that question. And it's a very complex question. And a complex question has complex um, responses and intricate responses. And the one thing that I noticed was that um, we seem to have mythologized our transition. And Arnold Toynbee, in his famous book, A Study of History, said one reason for the failure of states and civilizations is when states and civilizations become fixated in a, in a glorified and ephemeral past. And I believe that our glorification of the transition is now becoming counterproductive and that we are looking at South Africa uh, driving forward through a rear view mirror. And we need to look very, very carefully at changing the way that we communicate and changing the way that we negotiate. And we are in a very vulnerable position and collective bargaining is one of the most important sources of social dialogue in this country. And it's, it's failing because it's conducted in a sclerotic and conflictive manner. And it's imperative that bottom-up ways of cooperation are discovered to reconcile the needs of the various parties. Employers will need to constantly retrain and update the, the knowledge and skill of the employees. And I believe that the training process in our um, labor legislation, our labor legislation to me is actually a conflict production factory. It um, glorifies conflict. It is completely out of touch with the fourth industrial revolution which we are in at the moment and the rules of engagement focus d predominantly on conflict in times and circumstances where cooperation and collaboration and other modes of uh, and rules of engagement are absolutely imperative and we, so we're creating our own cold war in in the country um, the approach to negotiations is of contest and disaster, it's win-lose, and more often lose than, than win. So there are fundamental lessons which need to be unlearned in the way that we conduct collective bargaining. Um, one of the reasons for this huge amount of conflict that we've got in South Africa is because we do not have a systematic way of addressing and finding satisfiers for fundamental human needs. There are frameworks that are available that are really robust, and fundamental human needs can be seen as both deprivation and as potential. The huge skill in negotiation is how do you convert deprivation into potential. Um, the way that collective bargaining is actually understood by the main parties to the process is very different. There are different definitions of collective bargaining. So for the businessman, it would be negotiating on terms and conditions of employment. For the, um, tr uh, the employee, it would be negotiating on terms and conditions of employment and the search to discover satisfiers for fundamental human needs. For the trade union itself, it would be to have um, a, a, an agreement on what constitutes a living wage. Um, which might not be in the realms of economic feasibility or might. And then for the state, it is to have actually a structure for, for wage setting and, uh, and administrative law on terms and conditions of employment. So they're very different, and often the conflicts that emerge emerge around those basic uh, differences in definition at the core. Business should be an agency for change in South Africa and the challenges are so incredibly serious they see the end of their responsibility as being at the factory gate so to speak and this is hugely problematic because what's happening outside the factory gates is now flowing right into the factory gates and causing all sorts of mayhem and the interesting fact is if you go along and look at the causes of service delivery conflict and the causes of strikes, they are actually the same or very, very similar. They see the same failure to discover satisfiers for fundamental human needs. I offer frameworks for satisfying those fundamental human needs developed by Max Neff and his team 
from the Dach Hammarskjöld Institute in Uppsala in Sweden, and they are really very, very useful um, frameworks uh, and can be applied. So one of the reasons why I, I believe that we have so much conflict about transformation in South Africa is that we don't actually understand, we don't have a, a clear framework of what we're transforming towards. And if you actually understood a framework of fundamental human needs, that would be very, very helpful indeed. I'd say most of the inequalities that remained at the time of um, apartheid actually exist and are being perpetuated at the moment. And we need to start seriously communicating with one another and turn human deprivation into potential. And this needs to be done seriously. But it's a complex matter. It can be done. The frameworks are very, very powerful. But it's not a simplistic, short, term, um, impulsive approach. It requires very, very careful consideration. If you go along and look at the showdowns that are taking place in Parliament all the time, it's the, the, the constant, consistent pattern is that no, uh, deep-rooted conflict issues are treated as normal conflict issues. They try to, there's an attempt to routinize them, and this creates a, a climate of continual escalation. Then we have uh, a destructive attribution of blame. The tone of the actual negotiations that is taking place in South Africa is often one of mutual vilification, of deep, deep, deep disrespect and disregard, and that needs to be changed. And if I had to make any recommendation about the way that industrial relations is taught in South Africa, I'd scrap all of the current curricula around the country and start over again. I believe that the, the way that is taught is actually feeding into the system of perpetual conflict. It is a, a, a creating a great tension in this country. I conducted an environmental um, scan of the conflict configurations in, in South Africa of some which I felt are really important. And these are all interacting with various other configurations and stakeholder groupings. And I looked at corruption, <coughs> financial incompetence in the trade union and movement. And uh, I, f I found, for example, that the levels of trust in our trade union movement has um, dropped remarkably over the last um, several years. There's certain research that validates that. But one issue which really surprised me, I never knew about this, was that um, there's an enormous amount of tax fraud that's taking place on trade unionists, um, on worker pension funds and provident funds. Um, it's, it's at a, a cosmic level. And so this is creating deep distrust and problems within COSATU, within the trade union movement itself. I did a, an analysis of the South African Democratic Teachers Union, sad to, versus the Ministry of Basic Education. I found that an extremely interesting case to, to look at. SATU has 260,000 members, and it operates in all nine provinces. It has dominance in six provinces, and um, a commission of inquiry was conducted by uh, Professor Fulming, John Fulming, into the sale of teacher of, uh, of principalships and teacher jobs and, and so on. And it was very, very interesting in, in looking at, at this analysis and uh, what, what is going on with, within SATSU. And the only deduction that you can reach is that our basic education is education for unemployment. And that is a terrifying notion. Uh, my personal belief is that SATSU needs to be taken before the Constitutional Court um, uh, to be tested whether its behavior is congruent with the Bill of Rights or not. And I also um, think that we need a Chapter 9 organization to be established over education to ensure that democracy is protected in terms of the Bill of Rights and that this is injected into the, the society that we live in. The next element which is really very interesting is that the collective bargaining is taking place in the context of disruptive innovation. We're in this, this fourth industrial revolution where and a whole multiplicity of extremely advanced um, technologies and capabilities are coming to the fore. The traditional de definition of the factors of production is land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. And what's happening is that, first of all, labor through 
3D printing and um, robotics is being designed out of the system. And entrepreneurship with, um, with uh, artificial intelligence is also being designed out of the, the system. And so we have sort of two and a half factors of production. And so for a young child that is going into grade one, the, the research indicates that 67% of all careers that currently exist when they reach grade 12 will not be existent. And so it's incredibly important that we place our children and develop curricula that are on the right side of this fourth industrial revolution. What is so interesting about the fourth industrial revolution in terms of collective bargaining is that the traditional sort of um, first industrial revolution approach towards collective bargaining was um, you know, a mass meeting, a town hall meeting, a picket, a strike, and um, th those types of interactions. Now with um, YouTube, with uh, uh, WhatsApp, with uh, email, you can have a, a virtual cloud, a cr crowd which can form incredibly quickly and also disintegrate very quickly. And so the nature of the formation of crowds, the nature of the presentation of negotiation visually with YouTube, all of this is now changing. And so what's happening in South Africa is not unique to South Africa. It's part of a, a set of incredibly powerful international trends um, is that there's a denial of these, uh, of these changes because of huge insecurity and Brexit is just that one example of the, the type of mom uh, uh, movement that's uh, forming and it's a new form of Luddites who, who, who protested against the radical changes that are taking place. And I see new ideologies forming, new ways of thinking forming around this, and we're going through a very, very interesting stage. Uh, I believe that the critique that I offered of the, um, of the school system of basic education also applies to universities. And the central question that needs to be posed at universities is whether um, the careers that are on offer, the education that is on offer is going to be able to result in employment and there needs to be a constant dialogue between leaders, people that actually understand this fourth industrial revolution because it's changing all the rules of the game and the entire nature of employment and the entire nature of contracting. Okay. Then I look at the interaction between the employed, the unemployed and the tripartite alliance and a huge proportion of our population lives on social grants and if those social grants f because of an economic downgrade for example had to be terminated I believe we could get into a very very um, serious set of deep-rooted conflicts so I explore that interrelationship I explore the uh, student protests in the terms of the hashtag fees must fall. I'd started off innocently and uh, with a, a noble intent and then um, it became more and more complicated and more and more sucked into political processes and um, the idea is a fantastic idea but to be able to deliver on that and having alliances with political parties means that you get sucked into the political conflicts which are manifesting in those parties themselves. And so um, w what could very easily happen is that um, I know that Rhodes University, for example, is in an incredibly fragile position at the moment financially, is that we could actually have universities um, uh, under severe stress, let's put it that way. Uh, I look at the matter of the police and their conduct in industrial um, disputes, uh, look specifically at the Marikana and various other um, occasions and clearly they are not educated and trained and knowledgeable in dealing with deep and um, uh, deep rooted conflict and normal conflicts and mass movements and so they're part of the, they're part of the systemic problem and they need that education. Uh, look at the nature of unprotected strikes, vigilante action, xenophobic violence, the Zama Zama movements, and attacks on, on businesses and foreign nationals as part of this configuration to try to understand 
what is going on. The root cause of all these conflicts are the failure to systematically identify fundamental human needs and discover satisfiers to them. Slow process can be done, has been done. Um, all um, major restoration processes have actually spontaneously involved that type of, of process. One of the questions that arose um, in the discussions with Wilhelm and the team here was um, what should be done? How should, how should we um, develop a way forward? We've seen that social compacts, one of the suggestions that I made to Wilhelm right at the beginning was, you know, we need an economic cadessa. And Wilhelm made the comment to me, Jeff, um, social compacts have failed so regularly in South Africa post uh, 94 that this is naive, this is a naive notion. I looked at that very, very carefully indeed and I thought a lot about that. And I believe that um, a consultative business movement, rather like that structure that was used as the secretariat for the transition in South Africa, could be quite a useful platform for governing these types of conversations. But what is really very, very important is we need to get over our self-imposed autism and start communicating and entering into very, very serious discourse. The leadership of this entire process can't be for old people like me. It needs to be for the youth, it needs to be for young people to take this and to take it very, very seriously indeed and we need to create enabling environments to deal with these challenges. I do not believe that one of these challenges that we have here is overwhelming, that it's impossible. I have personally had the privilege of being involved in the background in, the, in certain aspects of the national negotiation process and did an analysis of the viability of CODESA and so on and so forth. I see now that uh, we have a different type of challenge, but it's of enormous intricacy and it requires conversation, goodwill, respect and trust and the, we have all the knowledge and capability to do it, it just needs to be sourced. And so Wilhelm, thank you very, very, very much indeed and everyone thank you for coming along to this launch. Jeff is establishing an African negotiation project at WITS, at the business school, which focuses amongst others on research uh, consulting, education and training um, and, and, and even uh, conferences to disseminate information around that at, at the Business School for, for the whole continent of Africa, which I think is a fantastic initiative. Now, I just want to ride on, on, on these comments about the fourth industrial revolution. Now, I've read a bit about it and it's the first time that somebody has really uh, applied collective bargaining or the other way around and, and, and spell out the the implications of the fourth industrial revolution on collective bargaining and trade union movements um, internationally and locally and especially within the development uh, a developing nation uh, uh, context and i think that that's quite breakthrough uh, uh, that's a wonderful breakthrough <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.